Johnny, if you've got questions, just let us know throughout. We're, we've got a full presentation and stuff, but um, <coughs> kind of if you save the questions till the end and you forget the question that you wanted to ask. With HDR, there's such a lot of, it's so early on, people's understanding of it, everyone's understanding of it, even the big corporations and stuff is very small, um, and it's all still being sorted out, so there's a lot of questions. So if you've got any questions, just give us a shout, on them as we go. The basic structure, we're going to do a talk on HDR. Mm -hmm. We're going to then do little questions and answer session. Then we're going to do a take talk on apps products. Mm -hmm. And then we'll stop for a hands-on and you can come and play with the stuff that we've got here. Um, if you want to. Technical setup, which I didn't explain last in this morning's session. We've got the um, Canon DPV2420 monitor, which is a mouthful but it's their new 4K reference monitor, so it's a 22 grand monitor, something like that, but it's proper HDR specification reference, broadcast quality reference monitor, which we're going to get on set. So, to see true HDR, <coughs> this, is, this is why we've got it here, so that we can do side by side, normal and HDR. Then we've got several, uh, oh sorry, the signal that's being fed into that is from this C300 over here, which I'll just zoom out to, um, so that is sending a C log 2 signal <coughs> into this, which is being looped out to be shown on here twice. And it's also being fed to that Shogun um, flame there. We've also got various other Shoguns and Atmos products to look at. Alright, cool. Over to you. Thank you very much. So, as Carl said, my name's Richard, I'm from Global Distribution. Uh, we're a distributor um, in the UK and EMEA wide. Um, we specialise in everything from acquisition uh, through to post-production and delivery and archive. Um, I've been in the industry for about 15 years. I'm by no means a colour scientist or anything, but HDR effectively is the biggest change in this industry for, for a generation. Um, so there's obviously, that's really the whole point of this presentation, is to kind of demystify some of that technology and the terminology for you because um, it's really actually not that scary uh, and if anything I believe HDR will actually be adopted by the industry far quicker than HD was uh, and hopefully this presentation will try and give you an understanding of why that is um, and really why you shouldn't shy away from it today um, it's something that really you should be thinking about so <clears throat> in HDR hopefully you can all kind of see the screen alright and I don't intrigue too much but there's a, a lot of terminology bounded around, a lot of acronyms and abbreviations and standards uh, that have kicked out. But the key thing really about HDR is it's about utilising the dynamic range that's now available to us because of how screen technology has evolved. So if any of you here have shot log, hands up, you've all basically shot HDR, you've shot a high dynamic range in that log profile and we'll, we'll talk about this in detail later. The key thing is, is we've been restricted by standards that have existed for a long, long time that haven't really evolved as quickly as camera technology or as um, screens have in recent years. So visible light is often the most defining factor in the images that we create and ultimately how we see them. So shortly I'll talk about the standards and how we've got to, but as a creative filmmaker, they are you know, really quite important to how the end result looks. So, you know, shooting log and, and working with kind of high dynamic range, and we all see high dynamic range with our eyes in the real world, but as we've been looking at things on, on TV, we've been bound by uh, these standards that have restricted us. So, key thing I would like to point out about HDR, it's not another 3D. It's a very, very important fact that 3D really came about at a time when, you know, studios were struggling to get people into cinemas, they needed a new way, something else to charge a higher ticket price and all that kind of thing. 3D technology was relatively old, just wrapped up in a new package and resold to you because it was easier to kind of do that. But as we've seen this year at shows like CES in Las Vegas, the big technology show, a lot of TV manufacturers have now dropped 3D altogether. It's kind of disappearing off the radar. They're not interested in not developing it anymore because it's not really taken off from a consumer perspective. It's really been limited to use in the cinema. HDR is very different to that because it applies to HD, 4K, future resolutions like 8K because we're talking about how we handle visible light and luminance within an image. So let's talk a little bit about <coughs> kind of where we've come from and how we've looked at uh, um, TV. So we've got CRT technology, we moved to rear projection, everyone always remembers how expensive plasma TVs when they came out in the, in the 90s. Um, LCD, LED, 
We've moved to OLED technology to kind of improve contrast ratios and things like that. Um, and obviously quantum dot technology. And you can see here how the standards have related to that. So REC 601, so REC is the recommended standard. Um, so 601 was the SDTV for standard definition. REC 709 obviously has come around with this advent of kind of plasma and LCD, LED generations. Uh, and that's really what we know today. That's the standard that we're all very aware of. It's the HDTV spec, REC 709. Now, probably lesser known is REC 2020. So REC 2020 really came along at this kind of LED onward kind of stage. Um, <clears throat> and if we move to the next slide, oh, not that one. Um, come to it later. Um, so really, this is then where things have changed. Everything up to this point has been governed by a set kind of luminance value um, that's kind of restricted how we view and deliver content. REC 2020 changed that and has started to increase this luminance limit. So basically, the point is REC 709 is not enough. We've been restricted by it for so many years. You know, um, and REC 2020 and REC 2100, which I'll talk about later, has really opened this up. It's conformed new recommended standards that are very future-proof. Um, and the key implementation with this is, is HDR and this higher dynamic range to actually gain the technology that's out there in these screens, this brightness, this luminance value that screens are now capable of, to actually deliver uh, a piece of content that's much more engaging by showing this wider dynamic, higher dynamic range. The problem we have today is there are screens out there that are three, four, five hundred nit, etc. Our phones, our tablets, etc. But all these brightness capabilities are being used for at the moment is purely to show that image in more ambient light environments. So say I go outside, I want to be able to turn the brightness on my phone up so I can see the screen properly. If I'm watching TV with the curtains open, I still want to be able to see it. It's just turning up that brightness. It's not actually giving me anything else. It's showing me the same image, but it's just showing it brighter. So HDR is really a revolution beyond resolution. And this is a very important message because we're talking about a change to luminance and the way that we see dynamic range as a result. Um, and that is not bound by a specific resolution. Ever since we went from analog film and we went to digital, we went to SD, to HD, to 4K, 8K will come, future resolutions I'm sure will also uh, be upon us. HDR is irrespective of that, it doesn't matter what it is, it doesn't matter on the resolution. So <clears throat> let's just talk about this evolution of standards. So just a little bit of... Um, checking in first of all. So what you can see here in the chart is basically the colour map of what the human eye is capable of seeing. So this is the colour spectrum that the human vision system can see. Um, in the middle here we have what's referred to as our D65 kind of white point. Um, now talking back, REC 601, that was standardised um, as a in as, a, as an approved recommended standard in 1982. Now, REC 709 came along in 1990s, so eight years later. REC 709 is still predominantly what we're using today. So this is very, very, very old standards. REC 2020 was approved in 2012, but probably most of you haven't heard of it or certainly don't really know anything about it. And it really came along as the earlier slide showed, to incorporate the technology that Ultra HD TVs were now starting to utilise. So a key thing here is about the colour spaces um, that these standards use, because these standards define resolution, frame rate, the colour gamut, the colour resolution and the colour bit depth. So all these elements that make up the image that we see on a screen, these standards are, are setting um, the specifications for that. Now, if I look at REC 601, it's this kind of grey dotted line here, so I'll just point it out so you can all see it. REC 709 is that little dotted line just around it. So it's a very marginal change. Not really a lot happened. And the key thing is, is up until REC 2020 came along, the luminance standard limit was 100 nits, or candela per metre square. So you're, you're talking about from 1982 up until 2012, the standards were the same luminance limit and a very marginal change in colour. You know, I was born in 1983, so my entire life, the way pretty much that I've watched TV or film and things like that hasn't really changed. And I've noticed that because there's been a, 
a good kind of conform standard, which actually has been very good for filmmakers and you know broadcast infrastructure and technology. But it's at a point now where this TV and display technology is like, well, hang on a minute, we can do all of this. So why hold yourself back? So what we're moving to with um, the Rec 2020 spe um, specification is they actually now use the the BT 2020 um, color space, which is basically this big line here. So as you can see, that's a massive improvement. Um, I'll talk about this later when we actually start talking about color gamuts, but this kind of thick uh, black line there is the DCI P3. So that's the digital cinema standard that came out in about 2005. Um, so you can see that these newer standards are massively evolving um, what we see in terms of, of color. Now, what I'd like to talk about at this point is some of the key HDR standards and the fact that this revolution with HDR will be televised. And it's one of the reasons why I believe it will take off certainly at the same speed that HD did, or if not, far faster. Uh, there's already a number of standards around today. So there's Dolby Vision. So Dolby Vision was pretty much the first. It's a 12-bit standard. It actually has a 10,000 nit limitation. So if you think we're going from 100 nits at Rec. 79 to 10,000 nits, it's a massive step forward. And that's um, a bit of terminology here. Uh, an EOTF. Now, an EOTF stands for an electro-optical transfer function. It's a way of basically getting digital code uh, in terms of obviously, you know, a file or whatever we've created or shot in camera and transferring it to visible light on a screen. <clears throat> There's also uh, some other terminology you'll hear bounded around with HDR, which is an OOTF, which is optical to optical, um, or optical to electrical, which is an OETF, which is basically what your camera does. It's taking visible light in through the sensor, or uh, well, through the lens and the sensor, and then obviously encoding it to digital file formats. That's an OETF. So really, in terms of HDR, we're talking about this turning something from digital to optical again. Um, so Dolby Vision is a standard very similar to how um, Dolby Digital was in the old audio days. It was a way of encoding sound, so it sounded great, and you know, amplifiers and things started to develop it. Dolby Vision is a standard where cinema companies and studios will master content for Dolby Vision, and you have to have a box with Dolby Vision to get the most out of it or to use that uh, encoded signal. So SMPTE 2084, there's also 2086 that kind of sits around it as well. This is um, SMPTE's HDR kind of base standard, um, which is 10-bit. Um, it uses a very similar EOTF to Dolby Vision. Um, this is a PQ process, um, which stands for perceptual quantizer uh, or perceptual quantization. Um, so that's a way of standardizing. Here's my material. I'm mastering it to this PQ level. So this EOTF knows how to deliver this image for that screen or to that standard. So it's a very controlled mastering process, a bit similar to Dolby Vision, but kind of open. So that's kind of the SMPTE standard. Now, HDR10 um, is the most commonly deployed standard at the moment. So for example, uh, games consoles are using it. So PlayStation 4s are, are now having games with HDR uh, contents. They're using HDR10. Uh, the new Blu-ray standard, for example, um, so you've got the new Ultra HD Blu-ray standard. That's now using um, HDR10 encoding. Um, so again, it's using this PQ EOTF, uh, and it's using the Rec 2020 um, kind of standards uh, around that. So hybrid log gamma is um, one of the newer standards, and it's actually probably going to be the most relevant, certainly for broadcast. So hybrid log gamma was, um, or HLG as it's often referred to, was designed by um, the BBC in the UK and, and NHK in Japan. So kind of two of the biggest kind of broadcasters from a technological perspective have got together and said, right, we need an HDR standard that works for live broadcast and everyday use and to deal with the fact that people might not have HDR TVs, what do we do? We don't want to have to deliver mastered content because then we've got to deliver all these different kind of standards like you know, PQ1000, all these different kind of versions. So <clears throat> the ben key benefit of hybrid log gamma, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later on, is that um, hybrid log gamma doesn't require any metadata. So all the other HDR standards pretty much rely on metadata to say this is what it is, this is what you do, this is the standard that we conform to. Whereas hybrid log gamma doesn't require any metadata. And it's really why it's been developed in the way it has, so that when you transmit a hybrid log gamma 
piece of footage, if you've just got a regular standard dynamic range TV and a set-top box that doesn't know what HDR is, it just displays an image like you would be used to seeing today. If you've got a TV that is hybrid log gamma aware or display that's aware of hybrid log gamma, it basically will linearize that signal and improve it based on the capability of that TV. The downside of hybrid log gamma is, is that the producers of the content lose a little bit of control over it. You don't know exactly how that might look on a given device or given TV because you're letting the TV or device kind of render that out, so to speak. Um, but it gets around this challenge of how do we get HDR into people's houses. And it's the issue that broadcasters have had with 4K is because it's four times the resolution of HD, it's four times the amount of data, and that's a problem. That's why it's on-demand streaming services pretty much that are delivering 4K. Obviously, Blu-rays now moved to it because of the new capacities and way they can work with discs, etc. Um, but with HDR, we technically don't have this limitation, um, particularly with hybrid log gamma, that because it doesn't require any metadata, the infrastructure just needs to be upgraded. Um, I'll mention Technicolor briefly here. Really what Technicolor are doing, uh, they're more of a standards conforming. Um, so they're bringing all these other different uh, standards and, and ways of looking and viewing HDR together. So it's kind of like wrapping it up and giving um, clients a way of kind of conforming a lot of that. So if you've got all these different standards material, they can kind of wrap it up and handle it for you. Um, now the key thing really about why is HDR going to be very relevant to content creators like yourselves is this, Ultra HD Premium. So this is what the alliance has basically set. This was standardized at CES last year, so in January 2016, and it was the TV manufacturers got together and there were a set of standards put together to say, this is what a true HDR consumer TV has to adhere to. So the big step forward here is, um, obviously everything's H UHD, so it all has to be Ultra HD at 3840 by 2160, but the key improvements, it's 10 bit, 10 bit panels now. So we're doing away with this eight bit, we're doing away with banding and things. We're, we're getting much more uh, accurate and detailed and smoother color reproduction. We're also now seeing 90% of the DCI P3 color gamut. So we have to be at the screen has to be capable of showing at least 90% of that space. So that roughly equates to a 22% increase in the amount of color that you see on the screen on an HDR TV versus a standard dynamic range TV. That's a big, big increase. Um, they also have to have a minimum luminance of 1,000 nits, so uh, much, much brighter to be able to show this dynamic range correctly. It is slightly different for OLEDs. OLEDs only have to be 600 nits, and that's just down to the way that contrast ratios are kind of worked and how that relates to luminance and dynamic range. Um, but the key thing is, is there's now lots and lots of TVs. If you go into John Lewis or anything now, Panasonic, Sony, LG, Samsung, they'll all be ramming down HDR to you. Now, there is a lot of confusion to end users around that and consumers because People are marketing things as HDR because they're technically brighter, but they don't conform to a lot of the standards that are now set. So this is the magic logo that people need to be looking for. Manufacturers have their own logos and gimmicks and their own way of spinning certain features they have, but this is the key thing that they will all have somewhere if they're a true HDR panel, and that means that they are adhering to all of these standards uh, and requirements. Can I just check what you said about the go back to the mm -hmm. earlier um, point to say there. Mm -hmm. um, so would I see a difference? So that's a hand, that's a thousand nit, that's six hundred nit. No, so in terms of the way, I mean, you will obviously get variance in like how black something looks and how bright something is to a degree, but in terms of the, you know, in the same way that you get any variance from monitor A to monitor B or TV A to TV B. Um, but effectively, um, you wouldn't, the perceived dynamic range and color that you would see wouldn't be fundamentally different. So whether so if it's a thousand nit LED, the dynamic range and the detail in the image you see would be essentially the same if you looked at it on a 600 nit OLED. So a little bit of nitpicking here. Um, so nits are a measure of brightness. Um, so nit is what we normally refer to in this industry. It's what most people are familiar with. More scientific way of referring to it is a candela. One nit equals one CDM squared. Um, the more nits you have, the brighter something is. So we normally refer to nits in terms of screen brightness. Um, you calculate the contrast ratio by the maximum white divided by maximum black, and that's why the OLEDs um, have a 
better ratio. Um, stops, though, are what you guys are more familiar with in terms of filmmaking and shooting. So stops is the way that we measure luminance and light within that kind of capture process. So the increasing uh, by one stop is a doubling of the, of the luminance level within that. So essentially both of these measurements are doing the same thing. It's just defining how much visible light there is within a scene and obviously the detail in the dark and the, the detail in the lights. Um, so just a quick overview of SDR and HDR kind of pipelines. In an SDR workflow, you know, we're starting here with the actual scene that we see with our kind of human eye, we see all of the color and all of the contrast and all of the dynamic range with that. And in a current standard dynamic range pipeline, we're actually capturing most of that from a camera. I'll touch on this later on, but you know, camera sensors are immensely capable. I mean, most camera sensors are normally around 10 stops or more. You know, a lot of cameras are 14, 15, 16 plus stops of dynamic range. So we're capturing all of this dynamic range already. Our eyes are capable of seeing circa 20 stops of dynamic range. At any one time, you're realistically talking about about 14 stops that the human eye can see because you know we're quite adjustable. So if we're looking at a very, very bright light, we actually kind of crush dynamic range elsewhere to compensate for the fact that something else is very bright. Um, but as we go through this post-production process, you can see here we're actually still keeping a lot of this dynamic range, a lot of this information, the color, the contrast, the luminance, the, uh, is being maintained. And it's only at the point when we start to get down to distribution where we're having to conform to these delivery standards, to these recommended ways that screens are adhering to with this brightness and color limitations. And that's where we're just basically losing everything at the point that it gets to the screen we watch it on. And that's why colorists earn an awful lot of money doing very good color grading to take that compromise of what we saw here and captured and actually delivering it to us at something that still looks pretty decent. Um, you know, it's a very complex post-production process and you guys probably have a lot of experience with shooting with log and working with LUTs and grading this and having that kind of debate in post-production of you know where are my compromises going to be and ultimately we're then seeing all of this reduced so we but we're used to it you know we're used to seeing something on a screen and have done for a very long time that isn't the same as what we see with our our eyes naturally um, but that's the difference with HDR because what we're now getting with HDR is we're still working with this very similar capture process but all the way through post-production, mastering and distribution we're not having to throw any of that away and then when we get to distribution as well again we're not making those compromises so the end result with HDR is you end up with some creative content that looks very very similar to what our eyes naturally saw now that doesn't mean we can't stylize it and we can't you know, put our own take on it, you know, that's still a post-production process of how we can manipulate things, but we're not having to compromise dynamic range, we're not having to crush out detail in the blacks or blow out the highlights, you know, we can kind of keep much more of that image with HDR. Um, which is a key point to make again about how, from a, from a viewer's point of view, it doesn't matter what I'm looking at this on, whether it's my something that's like a small five or seven inch screen or whether it's a 50 inch screen or whatever, you know, that perception of the dynamic range, the color information and all of that kind of stuff is just as relevant. You know, if I'm stood at the back of the room there and I'm looking at this monitor, which is 4K, it doesn't make any difference to me whether it's 4K or HD at that distance. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail shortly. So kind of what I'm gonna go through now is really HDR is one element of really what we all want, which is to create better pixels. We want what we shoot just to look as good as possible. And we always want to try and make it look better and better. So high dynamic range is a thing that's really kind of unleashing this and, and kind of letting go with the market, which is, what, which is why it will be adopted um, very quickly. So, you know, it incorporates wider color gamuts. So this whole fact that HDR TVs and displays will be able to show us more color detail. Um, bit depths, we're moving from 8-bit to 10-bit, you know, there are cameras we can capture 12-bit, you know, post-production we can work with 16-bit, etc. Um, resolutions, so we've been going from HD to, well, SD to HD to 4K, 8K is coming along. So these are the kind of the four key elements that basically determine how good an image looks. So HDR is only kind of one aspect of that. Now I'm going to talk about resolution first, uh, and there's a tie-in here with frame rates as well. So 
just a quick recap of, I'm sure, everything you know. We came from SD and digital. We went to HD. HD went from 720 to 1080. Most broadcasts are still 720 and just upscaled to 1080. That's why when you watch the same film on TV and then you watch the same thing on a Blu-ray, the Blu-ray looks a bit better because it's actually, I mean, compressions and things aside, it's actually a true 1080p image rather than 720, you know, upscaled and then delivered to you in an interlaced format. You know, 4K is this um, UHD TV1 spec. Um, UHD 2, TV2, is 8K. That's not that far away. That's roadmap for around 2020. So in around three, four years, TVs are going to go 8K and Ultra HD Phase 2 will come in. Um, so, yeah, so this is the evolution of uh, resolution. Now, what I was kind of alluding to earlier is this. Uh, now, this chart here... Um, this really just kind of summarizes uh, just some of the formats um, in terms of resolution and frame rates that the various standards have used. But what I really want to talk about is the, what this chart here, and that's spatial resolution. That resolution is only relative to where you stand to that. So this chart here is basically based on um, NHK research as to at what point do certain resolutions become viable. So in terms of distance, if we say that we sit you know, half a meter or so away from a screen, you know, it doesn't actually matter what resolution that, that, you know, how big that is at, say, 20 inches. So the point is, if we start looking at the average person has maybe a 40-inch, you know, 32, 42-inch TV, that's kind of the average HD TV size um, that people have. Now, if I sit two meters away from that, HD looks absolutely fine. So if I've got a 40-inch TV, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of worth it. But if I start to sit closer to that, only at that point does 4K become relevant in the same size because my eyes can't resolve the extra resolution at that distance, which is why you'll find that most eight, uh, Ultra HD 4K TVs are actually massive because, you know, if people are sitting two metres away from them, if it's 30 inches, it's completely pointless. Their eyes won't see the difference. You know, when you move to a... Um, like a 50 or 60 inch TV, suddenly that's a much bigger screen. The resolution, my eyes can realize the difference and perceive that uh, and, it, and it's beneficial. So this drive, it's the main reason why, you know, most people, if you ask them who have a 4K TV, did you buy a 4K TV because it was 4K? They probably didn't. They bought it because it was thinner, lighter, had better sound, it fits on the wall nicer. You know, maybe it is a better picture, but not in 4K, but in HD, they just liked the look of the TV. You know, most people bought an HD TV because of the digital switchover. You know, it's these kind of things that have driven this move, whereas HDR is really going to be giving people um, a reason to buy a new TV because they will realize the difference that they can see in the image. Um, the other thing that's important to talk about with resolution is the effect of frame rates on that. So we're very used to, say, 25p and 24p for film and 30p and whatever uh, in America. So that's kind of the standard. We're used to shooting stuff for, say, 1080 p25. Happy with that. If anyone's here shot 4K, hands up, and you've shot presumably at 25p, you probably notice that if you shot the same scene, it doesn't look as smooth as the HD. If you shoot an HD version and then a 4K version, the 4K one just looks a little bit more juddery if you've got a lot of moving content going on. And that's basically because when you're moving something across the screen, you've got twice as many pixels to move it across. So a good example here is if you have a vertical line exposed for one frame and you want to kind of move it from the left to the right, it would take you on a full 1080p, 60 frames a second, it would take 32 seconds for that line to move smoothly with no blurring to the human eye to see. So if I do that same, same test at the same frame rate on 4K at 60p, it's going to take twice as long. It's going to take 64 seconds for that to go across rather than 32. So technically what I'd need to do is double the frame rate. So that's why there's a big drive now in the second section of the UHD TV spec to actually put 4K P50, 4K P60. It's why people like Atomos are driving with their newer products to do 10-bit 422 recording at 4K P50 and 4K P60 because that gives you the same smoothness as your 1080p25. 
So that's why these high frame rates that people will now be starting to talk about, and certainly cameras going forward are gonna be driving to increase the frame rate. It's not necessarily for this super slow motion, you know, shooting a high frame rate and slowing it down for natural slow-mo. Part of it's gonna to be to give you that smoother image at these higher resolutions. So it's kind of important to, to be aware of the relationship between frame rate and resolution as we grow. So now we're gonna talk about the HDR element, the specific dynamic range uh, component about making a better pixel. So Rec. 709 had this cap of 100 nits, which roughly equates to about five to six stops of dynamic range. There's not an official kind of figure on it. Most people will say it's just under six stops of dynamic range or thereabout. Um, so that's the amount of dynamic range we were seeing. Basically, anything above that was just like a hard clipping point. It just, you know, all highlight detail just went. There was nothing there. So anything above 100 nits would just be shown as pure white with no color, no definition, just white. So what we basically have here is some examples that you're probably all very familiar with. If we're shooting for Rec. 79 here, very typical scene, we have the choice if we want to expose the, uh, the subjects, the talent correctly, um, but a compromise of that is we're going to completely blow out all of the detail in the background. So other ways we want to get all the detail you know, in the sky, in a sunset and things like that, but sacrifice of that to get that correct we're going to crush and lose all of the detail in the low lights as well and that's just this compromise we're making with dynamic range so what we've all done as a number of you said you do is you'll shoot log so log is basically a compression of the luminance to fit all of that dynamic range into the image so here we can see the sea we can see the the kind of wind surfers and their kites and whatever and you know you can see the sky and the sun the details all there but in the way that a logarithmic curve works is it's in that compression it's it's desaturating the image and and you get that flat washed out look to it um, which is what you need to then do in post-production but as you know when you go into post-production you're still working to this rec 709 limit so you've got a grade within that and that's where um, monitors have got very advanced so what we can actually look at here is this image at the moment is this is an HDR image and this is a SDR image. So you can see the same scene. What Carl's now just done is put the Rec. 709, the, the SDR image, he's used the capability of the screen just to pump up the brightness of that. So really what we're looking at here is that the previous version of this image, this looked very, very flat and dull. And that's technically because that was official SDR 100 nit standard. What we've now done is this is a 1200 nit screen. So this is showing a true HDR image. This is just showing a Rec. 709 image turned up to 1200 nit. So it's just brighter. And this is what TVs have done for a long time. So if you go into a TV shop now, they're kind of falsely selling you a little bit the difference because you know, if I flick that back to the, the, the previous scene, so I'll get Carl to come back. You know the magic of this Canon monitor. I've never used it before. So if we just change that one back to the uh, official SDR, um, what TVs have got very good at over the years is, is using this brightness just to make SDR content look a bit better and more vivid. But in essence, based on the Rec. 709 standard, that is what it actually is. And that's where this is representing such a massive difference because we're now not using this to give you a false impression. We're using this HDR technology to give you the best out of the image, to make things look much more natural. It's not necessarily about making something look brighter, and I'll come to this later on. Uh, HDR is actually just about giving you a much more natural, much more engaging image where you don't make the compromise between your details in your lowlights and the details in your highlights. You can kind of maintain what looks like a natural image. So Rec. 2100 is the new standard. So I've mentioned Rec. 2020 earlier. That's been around for you know, over four years now. Rec. 2100 is very new. This was standardized in just July of last year. And what 2100 basically does is it was uh, pretty much Rec. 2020, but it's got additions which are very much focused around HDR. So it's incorporating both this new hybrid log gamma standard and PQ. So it's, in, it's bringing in hybrid log gamma now as well, which didn't really exist when Rec. 2020 came around. It's setting the, the benchmark at 1,000 nit luminance, which is the same as Rec. 2020, which is a, effectively giving you 10 plus stops of dynamic range. It's using the BT 2020 color space, so again, same as Rec. 2020. 
But here's one of the other big changes that 2100 bought, is it's now including support for HD resolution content. And this is really important, because Rec 2020 was all about Ultra HD. It was about 4K and roadmap for 8K, whereas this is now incorporating HD. So it's bringing the relevance of HDR to HD. So it doesn't matter whether you can't transmit 4K, and it's one of the reasons why the BBC and NHK, as I said, are focused on this hybrid log gamma, because HDR, you know, to upgrade, say, BBC HD, to upgrade Sky HD, all these HD channels we watch, to upgrade them to, to, to um, HDR just requires changing that transmission from 8-bit to 10-bit. You know, there's no more resolution, you don't have all those challenges, and with hybrid log gamma there's no metadata, so it makes that much easier. So we're going to see this very quick drive that broadcasters can start to adopt HDR technology, and they're all working on it at the moment, so it's not that far off. Um, there's also this big change here, so uh, REC2100 now supports frame rates up to 120 frames a second. And that is essentially so that when you watch something in 8K, you can play that high frame rate, it looks just as smooth as something that was at 25p in HD. So that's why all these standards are now being set. So whereas things like REC601 and 709 were so shoehorned, kind of, you know, kind of restrictive, these new standards have really been looked at what is happening now, what is going to happen in the future. You know, at the moment, the brightest screen you can get is 4,000 nits. The standard goes to 10,000. So uh, you know, the color space, this BT2020, there's no screen in the world that can show BT2020. But again, the standard uses it. So as time goes on, we can just start to, to further expand into that world. So, the next element is wider color gamut, and this is what HDR is really bringing in now. Um, wider color gamuts have, have been around for a while. Basically what a color gamut is, is pixels are made up of RGB, red, green, and blue references and, and luminance values. And a gamut just basically plots those colors against how we see it in terms of spaces. Um, so basically, the wider the color gamut you've got, the more color detail you're capturing, and the more information you've got to creatively play with to, to get your artistic impression across. So color gamut standards, um, you know, REC 601, uh, the SDTV, as you can see, kind of uh, tucked away kind of in the middle. Um, actually, that's not shown on there, but um, 709 is, uh, which as you can see, is a very restrictive kind of small space here within the human vision. Um, DCI P3 um, is really the one to kind of talk about here because, as I said earlier on, the UHD premium specification says a screen has to be capable of showing 90% of that kind of space. So it's quite a big improvement. And as I say, in real world terms, it's 22% more color thereabouts than what you get with Rec. 709. Now, camera manufacturers have been using wider color gamuts for ages. You've probably all got cameras, certainly any of you that have shot in log have got cameras that are shooting these wide color gamuts um, and capturing this, this much better color space. You know, ARRI have got theirs, Panasonic RED, Sony, Canon, etc. Uh, and they've been around for a while. And just to give you an idea of, of what they are, in terms of um, the human vision and what we can actually see, REC 709 only covers 33% of the color that we can actually see with our eyes. You know, DCI-P3 is going up to 45%. So, you know, it's quite a big... Um, quite a big increase. Rec 2020, this kind of benchmark that we're setting ourselves is, you know, nearly 67% of what we can see. So, something that's important to point out off the back of that is something called pointer's gamut. So, this was um, some research done at the start of the 80s, uh, or kind of finished at the start of the 80s, which was really determining um, what is actually naturally occurring colour. So, what, act what colour actually occurs in the real world through reflective light uh, that we can capture. And that's basically what pointer's gamut plots out. And that's this squiggly line here. So as you can see, BT2020 is much bigger than that. So what that means is everything outside of here that BT2020 could show, and in fact the human eye can see, isn't naturally occurring color. It's man-made, it's artificial, it's not real. So this is quite an important thing of, of this drive that if we're showing 90% of that DCI P3, you know, DCI-P3 is 86% of pointer's gamut. So we're getting very close now with HDR TVs and displays to actually show you 
what the human eye is capable of seeing that is naturally occurring in the real world. Everything else is man-made. So, you know, VFX artists over the years and, you know, sci-fi films and that kind of thing will, will benefit massively from this further expanse. But regular programming actually won't massively much because, you know, the colour doesn't actually naturally occur. So you can also see here in terms of pointers gamut, cameras that you might be using, so Sony S Gamut 3 covers 100% of what is naturally occurring colour. You know, other colour gamuts are just under that. Um, so we're actually already in camera able to capture a huge amount. And this is, you know, one of the reasons why camera sensors are so advanced and why Rec 709 has held us back for so many years. So if we look at chromacity in a colour gamut as a 2D space, so if we now put that human vision down there as a plot on our colour space there, what we do is... That's great that we've got all these extra colours, but the other benefit that HDR brings to these wider colour gamuts is its colour volume. So if we look at this now in a three-dimensional space, when we go up to 100 nits, yes, I've got all this colour volume in there. So that's all the, you know, the way that, that colour looks in terms of luminance, in terms of brightness. Now that I'm moving up to 1,000 nits and ultimately, hopefully, up to 10,000 nits, it's basically like pumping up that volume. So not only do you see a colour, but you start to see all the subtleties and the luminance detail within that. So, you know, as you start to get highlights in a scene, not only do you see uh, the colour of that coming out, but you're seeing all of the different detail. And the, the, the real world results of this is that HDR is giving you an image that looks far more three-dimensional and natural. You're still looking at a 2D image, but things suddenly have form and curve. Uh, and, you know, you're kind of not... You're not limited to this, what we're used to with Rec. 709 of things looking a bit flat. It looks like you're watching something on a TV. And it's one of the reasons that 3D will be dying off as well, because you don't have to put stupid glasses on for something to look much more engaging and have much more depth to it. The fact that you've got this increased colour space and volume will just naturally help an image become more three-dimensional and look much more detailed um, and lifelike. So highlight areas don't just become bright as they do when you pump up Rec. 709. They become more detailed. There's more information in there, which, which ultimately gives you um, a lot better creativity uh, from a filmmaker's perspective. So just a final fit for finish off on this, you've got the bit depth. Um, so everything up to HDR was an 8-bit delivery. We're now moving to 10-bit deliverables. Um, which is great because we've had 10-bit sensors in cameras for ages. Um, you know, people like Atomos have had 10-bit recording from cameras. So even if your camera can't do 10-bit, but the sensor's 10-bit, we can record that, etc. Um, what's essentially happening with with the bit depth and the way it's sampling is that obviously 10-bit gives you a much smoother color reproduction. So you don't finally with HDR we can say the end to banding um, within images. I mean compression makes that a lot worse because if you've got banding naturally in the image because it's 8-bit, you'll then, because uh, you've got the stepping in the colours, um, when you then compress that, that massively amplifies that. So if you start off with something that doesn't have visible banding in it and then you compress it, you still end up with a far better looking image at the end of it. So the difference between 8-bit and 10-bit is effectively the best part of a billion colour iterations. So it's a huge, huge difference uh, moving from 8-bit, you know, 16, 17 million colours moving up to 10-bit, um, which is over a billion colours. Um, so we're not throwing away any of those um, in, uh, colour information. Now, the thing to point out with HD is HD is really designed to be a 10-bit pipeline. So the one knock-on effect you should think about with camera choice is actually getting a camera that has a 10-bit sensor. Because at the moment, to my knowledge, there's not any standardization set to say for HDR production, it has to be a 10-bit camera. In the same way that for HD, they say you've got to use these codecs, and it has to be 50 megabits per second or whatever, um, to, to, to be approved for broadcast. At the moment, I don't believe that exists for HDR. Whether it does or not, because it's arguable that, yes, you should really have a 10-bit acquisition source, but HDR can apply to an 8-bit sensor. You, to be honest, the Alpha 7S is probably one of the easiest cameras to get an amazing HDR image out of um, so e quickly and easily because it's such a good low-light sensor um, that it, and it's got S-Log3 on it and things like that. You can get some very, very good images out of it, but it's an 8-bit sensor. So, you know, you will get some banding and obviously you're not able to sample this, you know, wide colour gamuts um, quite so accurately. So HDR today, there's a lot of it. 
It's very, very easy to get. Netflix have got well over 600 hours. I mean, that's quite an old fact, so I'm sure that's significantly higher now. Uh, Amazon, again, all their new content, all their flagship shows, you know, Jeremy Clarkson's new Grand Tour, good example, all shot 4K HDR deliverables. YouTube now, um, late last year, they've upgraded. So all of us could now go out, make a film this afternoon, go back, edit it, cut it, do it for HDR, upload it to YouTube. Anyone buying a new TV, everything's smart now. You've got YouTube built in. People can just watch that content in HDR. So it's giving everyday filmmakers the ability to actually produce very, very high-end content and just deliver it as well and just have anyone watch it. So if you're shooting a wedding or a corporate event or whatever, you can actually upload that, put it on a private YouTube channel and, and your client can enjoy that in full HDR. This is very deliverable as well. It doesn't have to be 4K, it could be HD. Again, same thing. You know, Voodoo, other, I mean, that's more of a kind of uh, other countries uh, on demand services, but again, Ultra HD, Blu-ray. So all these standards are now there um, for people to consume uh, content. As of December last year, BBC, iPlayer trials. So they did uh, Planet Earth um, on the iPlayer in December. Uh, so if you had a, an appropriate TV, because it was hybrid log gamma, there were obviously not that many TVs supporting it, so it was really select Panasonic models. But you could then watch on iPlayer Planet Earth in 4K HDR. So it's, you know, this whole kind of move is happening. And the BBC, um, interestingly, came out not that long ago and said, we really want the iPlayer to be the UK's number one streaming service. You know, at the moment, it is probably someone like Netflix. Um, but they want it to be that because they know they've got this great platform that can deliver all this content and it can be ultra HD and HDR because it's all internet. If you don't have a quick enough internet connection, it's HD, same way that Netflix is. You know, why the BBC haven't cottoned onto this sooner, I don't know, um, but it's this perfect platform for it. But beyond this, hybrid log gamma really opens this up for traditional over the air broadcast to also start moving to uh, you know, Sky have now come out and also said within, I think, the next year they're going to start offering subscription services without a satellite dish. So it will, again, use your IP connection and things like that just to deliver normal HD programming and things like that as well. So the way that broadcast is happening is changing, and the benefit for HDR is, is the challenges faced by all of these people aren't there in the way that 4K was because of resolution and bandwidths and infrastructure, metadata. Um, so it is going to be a very deliverable format. So that is the background on what HDR is. Um, the next section will really talk in a little bit more about what your camera does, what Atomus do, how that works together, and really how you guys as filmmakers today can actually start shooting and being aware of HDR or using HDR tools to even get a better SDR delivery. But at this stage, are there any questions on anything so far? No, at all. Cool. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, then, I guess. Brilliant. Yeah. So, why should you shoot for HDR today? So, key thing is, if you're shooting log already, I've mentioned you're already shooting high dynamic range, you just maybe aren't doing some things that you should do for HDR. Like, you might be underexposing the image. You might have quite a noisy image. You're not pushing the image as far as you are, as you, as you could or should. And that's because... You know, you're used to how that image translates to Rec. 7 or 9. You put a LUT on it and go, oh, crikey, that's blowing out, pull that back. Or you're following current guidelines about how to expose log. You know, Sony say, uh, you know, S log 2, I think, is exposed white around 58%, and you expose S log 3 white at around 52%. You know, it's quite low. Lots of people say S log 3 is noisy, um, and that's because when you shoot log, your noise level is that. And then if you let some light in, your noise level is the same because it's native ISO of the log. If you let more light in, your noise level stays the same, so your noise floor drops. So actually overexposing log beyond what they say you should is actually better for you. And that's why most people will tell you to expose log maybe another stop or stop and a half above where, say, the camera manufacturer says to do it. But you then start to get into that kind of slightly guesswork territory. You've got to have an appropriate LUT or... You've got to just look at the log image and your waveform and just kind of assume that it's okay. Um, Is this is an example of what happens when you yeah. put a normal Rick 709 LUT on log footage. Is that normally... It will look overexposed. If you're correctly exposing your log, 
if you're exposing the log like that, <coughs> that's a very nice exposure. That looks great. But if I put that in HDR or properly grade the log for SDR, it's probably a bit underexposed, you'll get a bit more noise than you would do. Oh, that's the point, presumably. If you'd exposed it there. So really with log today, you've probably just not realised the full potential of the log file you've been recording. So the other key thing is you probably don't need to buy a new camera. You know, with HD, oh, God, God, I can't buy a new camera. My SD cameras, my old whatever cameras aren't relevant. Got to go HD. Again, 4K came along. Oh, I've got to buy a new camera. With HDR, even if you've got an HD camera, like C100 or something like that, shoots log, um, you can film for HDR. You know, if you have a Sony FS5, FS7, C300, whatever it might be, you can now shoot for, for HDR. The only limitation is whether you've got a 4K camera or not. But then most people that have shot 4K anyway have been shooting 4K really for two reasons. Either to future-proof that content for repurposing down the line, but you've delivered an HD now, or you're shooting 4K to do a crop. So it's just, I don't have to worry about my framing so much, just shoot all of you and I'll just sort this all out in post. Or you're using it for very specific post-production effects. That's the main reason that people have been doing 4K. A lot of reality TV, for example, with PTZ cameras, all using 4K cameras, but they're taking multiple HD footage out of that. So I could point one 4K camera at you, take four HD feeds out or multiple HD feeds out, and I've got a shot of you, 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 and you, all happily from one camera. You know, those are the benefits. So with going HDR, providing your camera does log, don't need to buy a new camera. You just need to see how to expose correctly. So shooting for HDR as well also gives you better SDR deliveries. And this goes back to what I was just saying about the noise level. So, you know, if I'm exposing my log where the camera manufacturer says I should for normal Rec. 709 delivery, my noise is much more apparent because the amount of light in there and the noise level is, is at a high ratio. If I let more light in there exposing for higher dynamic range, I have the same noise level so I have a much cleaner image. And all I'm doing, normally if I shoot log, I'm just making this compromise to six stops of dynamic range. So I'm just moving that around, crushing out my blacks, blowing out some highlights, getting the bits I want. Obviously a professional colorist will do far more jiggery pokery around that to get even more out of the image. Um, by compressing different planes and things like that. But when you get to HDR, if I've exposed my log up here for HDR and I'm still delivering for Rec. 709, all I do is I still make the same compromise. You just might not put your same LUT on it that you did before because that will look overexposed. But if you create a new LUT or modify your LUT, um, or just if you're doing a custom grade, you'll just crush out more of that darks to get the highlight area that you want, you know, and then make that compromise of what you let blow out. So you're not doing anything different. So for HDR, you're still recording the same log file that you record today for SDR. You're just exposing it differently to get the most out of it. And that's why with HDR, anything that's been filmed in log or whatever, and even old films that can now be scanned back in, things can be gone back to and regraded for HDR. The problem is if you've not exposed something very well, you can grade for HDR, but you might not get the most out of it or it might be quite noisy and require more work. Whereas if you expose correctly um, for the scene, then you will obviously be able to get the most out of that HDR image in post-production. Um, but equally, you can just do SDR as well. So, you know, it kind of goes back to this whole dual purpose. Uh, and from an SDR point of view, you're still getting a better delivery. So the other thing that HDR gives you is it gives you an ability to enhance the narrative of the story you're trying to tell. So you're not losing detail in darks, you're not losing detail in highlights. You know, if that's reflections in glass or something with a scene of someone talking to someone through a window and, you know, you, you've got this creative element to actually tell more of the story by not having to make these compromises which affect how that story looks. So HDR does give you um, a lot of benefits in, in how you can kind of convey the, the story that you're trying to tell. So, Dynamic range of sensors, um, obviously sensors have had a high dynamic range for a long, long time. Um, most cameras are normally around 10 plus, as I say, you know, things like Sony FS5, FS7 are 14 stops. Um, you know, Arri Red, they've got cameras of 16 plus dynamic range. So what cameras have done internally to get round these hurdles is they've shot 12 or 16 bit raw off the camera, as would be the case in feature film, or they've used log curves um, to basically um, 
capture that dynamic range, but you've got this desaturated image. And as you can see here from the diagram, Rec 709, as my reflectance and my luminance goes up, I basically hit my ceiling, boom, gone, just everything's clipped out. Whereas what a log curve is doing is basically compressing that, bending that in to give you all of that detail. So log curves were actually invented um, back in the early 90s by Kodak, and they were used for basically film scanning to take analog film in, create a digital negative, um, A, for repurposing and distribution down the line, or for, you know, VFX and digital formats to work with it and then put it back to, to film. So it's not a new technology. It's been around for a long time. And when cameras went digital, camera manufacturers applied the same mathematical logarithmic curve in there to achieve the same thing of how we can capture you know, digital from an optical to an electronic format, this OETF, uh, and keep all that dynamic range in there. Now, what happens with um, linear sampling, so if you're sampling without log, um, lots of cameras have very good gamma profiles and things like that to try and improve how this is done, and depending on the environment you're filming, you might use a, an appropriate gamma curve. Um, but basically what it's doing is you're sampling much more in the highlights, that kind of top end of the spectrum, to try and get as much of that detail in there before the image clips out. When you shoot with log, you basically have evenly spaced sampling. Now log, if it's underexposed, is horrific, because if you drop right down, this doesn't work very well. It, it, it applies much better on that upper half of the spectrum. Because as you can see, Rec. 709 and, and log up to a point 40-50% is actually pretty similar in terms of what it's doing. It's the top end of the spectrum where it's bending all this extra data in through the compression. Now the, the benefit of this is, is, and this is really where going back to what I was saying about shooting this and mastering it for SDR and HDR, is that, and you can see this very easily on a waveform when you set a, a correct exposure on a, on a log based image, is that the shape of the waveform will look the same whether I expose it here or I expose it up there. That the shape of the waveform, the contrast information, say if you were filming my face, that would look exactly the same exposed here as here. The shape, the contrast detail on my face, it's just one would have more luminance, more brightness in it, and one wouldn't. The problem is when you're just looking at a flat log image and you start to make it brighter, it just starts to look very difficult to see what you're actually doing. So then you put a LUT on it, but a LUT is based on Rec. 709 technology. So people have often put uh, a lot to look at the highlights and then a lot to look at the lowlights and you're kind of flicking between them and it's always still a little bit of a guessing game to a degree but it certainly adds a lot of complexity to working on set. So hybrid log gamma, um, just to quickly go back to this, hybrid log gamma is um, basically a mixture of kind of log technology and gamma. It's doing a very similar thing where it's compressing that image in terms of the dynamic range. The difference is it doesn't need something else to kind of linearize that. What it does is when you, if you plug a um, an hybrid log gamma input into a standard dynamic machine V, it just looks normal. It kind of looks like a normal gamma profile with a knee applied to it to kind of fit it in. If you put it onto an HDR TV, it will basically linearize that to just scale it out. And like I say, the benefit of HLG is it does that depending on the capability of the television. So if I've got a 1,000 nit TV, it does it based on 1,000 nit. If a 2,000 nit TV comes out, it does it based on 2,000 nit. It keeps scaling. Um, so it's a very, very good technology. And it's interesting to see that Panasonic um, with the GH5 um, <coughs> now incorporates hybrid log gamma. Or it won't be on release, but it will be through a firmware update in the summer, I believe. Um, so that means that if you want to shoot HDR, with hybrid log gamma on a GH5, you'll be able to do that straight off the GH5. It's just gonna do this. So if you're delivering for SDR, great. If you're delivering for HDR, uh, perfect. Um, obviously, GH5, like other cameras, also has log. So you have the other way if you wanna heavily post-produce that. HLG is really gonna be used for that more shoot and deliver type content, whereas things like HDR10 and Dolby Vision and all these kind of other PQ formats will be for specifically mastered content. Um, so, just going to talk a little bit about what Atomos now do with their Atom HDR engine. So, this is a proprietary image processing system um, that is designed to understand the logarithmic application going on within the camera and linearize that for, for HDR. Um, all you need is a camera with a log output or a camera that supports hybrid log gamma, and this will work straight away for you. Um, 
So what it's really doing is unleashing the full capability of your log uh, camera. So here you can see basically Rec 709, obviously we go straight up and we clip out. Something like um, C-Log, for example, which is this curve here, has a fair amount of dynamic range, but the, the log curves you want to be really working with in camera um, for high dynamic range scenes, and I'll touch on this again later, but something to, to be very aware of with HDR is not all scenes are, are HDR, or high dynamic range. If I'm looking at you guys now, I'm probably seeing six stops of dynamic range. There's nothing here that's jumping out at me. So actually, the, the confides of Rec. 79 are kind of fine for this. You know, if I start going outside and dealing with sunsets and sunrises and lots of other things, or car headlights going on with other uh, ambient lighting going on, then I'm talking about a very high dynamic range scene. So it's a case of shooting appropriately um, for the scene. But you know, if we want to capture very high dynamic range scenes, these other log um, curves are much better. Things like uh, log C from ARRI and, and obviously S log 3 and C log 2. They're going much, much further into the dynamic range. And obviously here you can see that's where our kind of current 1,000 nit kind of limitation is. So what Atomos can support at the moment is essentially up to 1,500 nit. The Ninja Flame, Shogun Flame, Flame Series and the Shogun Inferno have a 1,500 nit brightness screen. <coughs> so I can put that into HDR mode and here I'm looking at a true HDR image of it or I can just look at it as a log input and see a high bright screen, for example. Now, if I was looking at this scene in um, HDR, looks like that, that's what it would be like in SDR. It would be completely blown out. But the point is, is this SDR grade, I could still put a LUT on that, and that's now Rec. 709. It just doesn't look as nice as the HDR that I'm capable of getting out of it. Even though it's not a massively high dynamic range scene, it's just giving it much more natural appearance in HDR than it is in um, SDR. So what Atomos basically do is they are aware of the logarithmic curve of pretty much all cameras, and I'll cover that on the, the kind of next slide. But the Atom HDR engine gives you a very simple system. So you dial in the type of camera, the type of log curve, and the color gamut that you're working with. So then we're basically linearizing that signal from the camera correctly. We then give you uh, a dynamic range slider. Um, so here on the far left, we are SDR. So that is 100% of Rec. 709. On the right, we have the maximum capability of that log curve. So this will change depending on the settings you've got for the camera. So this slider goes further if I'm, say, shooting log C or I'm shooting S log 3 than if I was shooting like S log because it's dependent on the curve uh, that we're working with from the camera. I can move this in half stop increments. So the nice thing is, is going back to what I was saying earlier right at the start about nits and stops. So we have this 100% of Rec. 79, so this value of where we are, say, from a deliverable kind of standard. And on the right, we're seeing our acquisition, what we're talking about, what we're seeing in, with our eyes in terms of dynamic range and stops. So if I move this here to 400%, so I've moved it two stops, 400% of Rec. 79, you can see that with my image here, I'm clipping out all of this data in the waveform above this line. And Atomos have this dynamic waveform. You can view it in a traditional waveform way, and it will scale. But rather than our waveform going from 0 to 100, it will go to a much higher value dependent on this capability of the dynamic range of the, the log curve. So what I'm doing here, as I've now moved this with S-Log2 to now uh, two stops of dynamic range, you can suddenly see that in the image, a lot of the detail in the sky and the sea has suddenly come back in. Like the kite here is pretty much exposed on its own. I can't see any detail around it. Now, with just going two stops of dynamic range above Rec. 709, I can suddenly see all this detail coming back in my image. If I go to the full capability of the log curve, you can see here that here, the, the, the highlights around the sun are clipping out. Here, you can see that my whole waveform, everything the camera sensor data is capturing, is contained within my new HDR ceiling. And as you can see, the scene starts to look much more natural again, and I'm seeing the full detail. It's like taking the log image I had earlier, which normally I'd make this compromise to going into Rec. 709. It's taking that, and it's keeping all of that detail. Now, it's important to point out that a lot of colorists have got quite good at 
grading an image to keep all of the dynamic range in the scene, but you get slightly washed out, faded. The blacks aren't particularly that rich. And actually, stylistically, it's become quite common now. You can watch a lot of TV programming that has a bit of a log vibe to it, and that's because people have got so used to seeing the dynamic range, they don't want to lose it. With HDR, you're looking at that same sort of image, but um, kind of like Carl was showing in the monitor there, it just starts to pop out. The blacks are still deep, they're still rich and vibrant. You haven't had to lift them to maintain the dynamic range in the highlights, etc. So this Atom HDR engine is incredibly simple. You have this very easy to use slider that just allows you to view the log image depending on the scene with the full dynamic range capabilities. We also have an auto HDR button, which essentially what that does, it analyzes the log curve and works out how much dynamic range there is in that scene based on that curve, and it will set your slider at the appropriate place. The other way of using it is you just move the slider until what you're looking at on the screen is pretty much what you're seeing with your eyes. That's supposed to be the simple intuitive way. So you're effectively shooting what you see for the first time rather than shooting and seeing a compromise and working around that compromise. If you've got a situation where you um, need to just send it off straight away, can you record that look into the automation? No, so it's not. So that's really where hybrid log gamma comes in. So if you were to shoot something uh, with hybrid log gamma, then when you pump that into something that understands hybrid log gamma, it's just ready to go. One of the things that Atomus are looking at, it's not officially announced or committed, is lots of people are asking for it. It's like an auto HDR button uh, sort of thing, so that basically in the way that we export metadata for tagging like favorite, reject, and marker points within a clip is actually to export on a clip basis. This was the color gamut. This is how it should look. So almost in the same way that you apply LUT, it's kind of like, here's the settings of what you shot and how it is. So when you put it into post, you drop that info in, and you don't have to go into resolve or you know, whatever you're grading in and start setting it to that point. It's kind of like a starting platform in the same way. Because HDR isn't a LUT. It's, it's essentially doing um, a similar sort of, what Atom HDR is doing a similar thing to what a LUT does, um, but HDR and the Atom HDR engine isn't a LUT. Um, but yeah, so at the moment there's not. You would have to load that footage in and then start to grade it. There are some good tools online actually now. There's some people making some sort of conversion tools. So you can like take an existing LUT and load it in and it basically extracts all the chromacity detail and you set a new luminance value and then it just conforms that. So then when you go into HDR post-production, you can kind of drop those looks and things that you're used to kind of in. Um, so you've got that kind of stylization, so you don't have to start all that from scratch. Uh, and then you can just start to grade around with your uh, luminance. But the key thing with HDR is, is actually the grading process becomes much simpler because you're not, the reason that colorist and grading um, is so intensive is because you are making these massive compromises throughout the process, which you need to be pretty skilled at doing to do well. Um, otherwise, it's really just a stylistic thing of how do you want something to look and how do you make certain bits of the image pop. With HDR, that's much easier because it will just naturally start to pop if it's been filmed correctly. And then it's just a case of stylizing it in the appropriate chromatic ways um, or um, literally just pulling out this section or pulling that section back, etc. So just kind of tweaking it to how you see. So maybe lifting the blacks a little bit or you might want to crush away the blacks a little bit. So you can still do that with HDR grading. So for the Atom HDR engine to work, all you need is you just one of those cameras. Um, so Blackmagic, they don't share their logarithmic curve data, so we can't support that. Um, but Sony, Panasonic, Canon, JVC, Arri, Red, and Fuji have now added it on their new X-T2 um, camera. Um, you then select the log format. So is it C-log, C-log2, C-log3, whatever, S-log. Um, you then choose the color gamma, and that means that you're looking at an image that's correctly mapped. In the same way that a LUT goes on, you know what it's going to look like. This is just linearizing. In the same way that you do a you know, log to rec 709 conversion, this is just doing the same thing, but using the luminance capabilities to show you that in true HDR. Um, so the 1500 nit screen is basically mapping that correctly to show you up to your 10 plus stops of dynamic range. We also support PQ and hybrid log gamma input. So again, Cameras that are coming out supporting hybrid log gamma, so GH5. If you're not using log and you want to shoot HDR, you put it into HLG mode, put it into the Atomus, and you'll just see what that looks like in true HDR. Um, PQ is really relevant for use on other productions. So we can actually take a PQ input rather than a camera. So say, for example, you want to do an HDR production on a budget, you don't have 20 odd thousand pounds for one of these to grade something properly you can use an Atomus screen, take an output from your Resolve or whatever into there and grade on the seven inch, just set it to a PQ input 
it will then see exactly what's coming out Resolve and, and grade to that. So you can say, I want to do grading in Resolve to PQ1000. This will then see 1000, or you can you know, and, and see that and show that to you in a 1000 nit uh, fashion, so you can then grade to that. Likewise, if you're on set and you want to output something from something that's already being worked on, say you've got a colorist on set, again, you could just use this on set to review what they're grading of the material that you've just shot. So we support that PQ input and also uh, HLG input as well. So we also integrate with other HDR workflows as well. So we have this PQ output. So I can output PQ from my recorder to another HDR monitor. So if I'm on set and I'm coming straight off a camera into my recorder, but the producer director wants to see it and he does happen to have one of these, then we can pump through to that and we can do a translation. So we say uh, PQ to this standard, so 1,000 nits, 1,500 nit, this is 1,200 nit, so we can set it to that. We then select the color space you want to see it at. You know, I might be coming from a Canon camera, so I'm shooting a, uh, a BT2020 or I'm shooting a Cine, you know, a Canon Cine gamut or an S-Log Cine gamut. What I can do is I can then convert that to DCI-P3 or BT2020, so it's going to remap the colors correctly to what I want to work with. Um, so all of those capabilities are built in. And again, we have hybrid log gamma output as well. So if you then want to output to see what that would look like in hybrid log gamma, so you're not working with a camera that is hybrid log gamma, you're working with a camera that's log, you know, Canon, Sony, whatever, and then you want to just convert that to a hybrid log gamma output, the Atom HDR engine will do all of this inside. So it's an incredibly powerful tool um, that really just integrates with everything. So, just to recap, I kind of touched on this lightly earlier, but remember that HDR isn't just about an overall increase in brightness. It's about the detail that that brightness gives you, the, the detail in the lowlights and the highlights. And not everything that you shoot will require high dynamic range. So, you know, this is uh, an image courtesy of Dolby that kind of highlights in the real world how bright certain things are when you look at them. So, you know, in terms of how bright that yellow would look to your eyes, it's around 14,000 nits. It's very, very bright. Um, you know, if you were to look at the sun, that's something like 6 billion nits or something in daylight. It's, it's incredibly bright. Um, so what we're really talking about with HDR is it's not just about the whole image looking brighter. It's, it's about the, going back to this color volume as well, that that yellow and the, the orange and the blue starts to look much more natural, much more vi vibrant. It has a lot more volume to it. So when you look at an HDR image, it's very apparent the extra detail that you see. It's not like you're looking at it going, crikey, I need to put my sunglasses on. There will be parts of the image that will become bright. And whereas on a, on a older television set, you would start to see that you know, a bright light or a car headlight would look bright but it wouldn't look really bright. With HDR, that can look pretty bright to the point where you could be looking at something on the screen that's bright, close your eyes, and you will see that still imprinted on your, on your eyes for a second or so. You, know, you don't really get that so much with Rec.7.9 unless you're watching something in the dark and your screen brightness is turned up massively. So we can also, we have a, a soft highlight roll off as well on Atom HDR. So when something does start to clip and it does get high, bit like with film we could do a soft roll off so it just kind of flattens out some of those highlights just to make it look a bit smoother rather than looking a bit OTT punchy uh, to look at. So essentially the detail over anything above 100 nits will just start to look much more detailed in HDR than, than you would elsewhere. Key thing just to kind of mention around this is you need to shoot for HDR appropriately so don't jump in and try and shoot um, everything in HDR at the maximum setting. Don't start trying to overexpose things. The idea with HDR is really to get natural looking images and images that are exposed appropriate for the scene that you're shooting. Um, so that's kind of a key thing that I like to remember and I'll touch on this here. So things to consider with HDR is, you know, DPs and colorists are probably gonna start working closer together. So, you know, obviously what you're doing in terms of exposure on set, you might wanna have a a chat with the guy that's going to do the post-production so you're basically working to this to achieve the same results because you now have this capability of achieving so much more um, you know how each plane in the scene is going to be exposed because of how that might be graded you know pay attention to things like lighting there's not going to be any escaping you know when lighting before might clip out and it will just be a white highlight on someone if that's a, a red light that's doing that 
you know, in Rec 709, when you're clipping that out, it's just becoming white. In HDR, you'll start to see the luminosity of that color coming back. So you will start to see some of that color in the highlights. So you need to be aware of, you know, if it's natural lighting, then it's great, it's fine. Um, but when you're talking about artificial lighting, you need to be very conscious of this. Um, and also things that normally might be crushed away and not visible in the blacks, you know, they might start to be seen. So make sure that, again, you haven't left something in the way that normally you go, oh, no one's going to see that because it's so dark. Actually, you might start to see some of that detail in the low light. So be careful about sets, framing, arrangements, props, that sort of thing. And then really, this is something that my spinal tap reference for the, for the talk don't turn it up to 11. There's, in the same way that audio had a war of loudness, where you know in the early 2000s, sort of limiting and compression and maximization technology really stepped forward, and it was all about my record needs to sound louder than their record. And with HDR, there is a danger that people will artificially start trying to pump up this brightness rather than using it to enhance the image and the storytelling. They'll be using it to artificially pull things out and, and make them pop. Current displays will struggle with that. You can get haloing and things like that around very bright parts of the image because although we're talking about screens that are high nitage, they're not able to show the whole screen at that full brightness all the time. It's elements of the image um, are high brightness, other elements are, uh, are not. So when you start artificially pumping up parts of the image, you can get various issues with that. But also, in the same way that HDR photography is very different to HDR video, HDR photography was about two exposures so that basically you have the capability to, to grade around that to get a very dynamic looking image. The problem with HDR photography is, is it often looks very unnatural um, and obviously there's the limitations of well if it's printed you can't have a print in HDR and screens they're viewed on are not HDR and things like that. The, the big issue you can have with HDR video is people can start to grade things so they look quite artificial which is you know fine if stylistically that achieves the result you want but it doesn't necessarily translate to every application and, and in my view shouldn't do you know HDR is there to really enhance the image and make it look more natural and ultimately therefore much more engaging and enjoyable to watch um, so those are the things really that you have to be careful of with HDR and that is pretty much it. Okay, well, thank you very much, Richard. Um, have we got any questions before we wrap up? If, if, you, if you've shot something in HDR, mm -hmm. but you haven't actually got an HDR monitor to grade on, yep. what, what are the limitations? So this actually is the, the biggest stumbling block with moving to an HDR workflow. So it's great that you've got a camera if you buy an Atomos, you can then, I mean, you don't have to have the Atomos to shoot for HDR. You can just shoot, log, and grade it. It's just a question of you want to make sure you're getting the best out of your log image to do that. Um, the problem comes in post-production. That's one of the reasons why Atomos put the PQ in. So you can basically use that with your grading software to grade on that and see what it would look like in HDR. Or you obviously have to pay to go to a colorist. And most, certainly all the main ones, people that own one of these, um, or you know, Sony have the, the BVM, they're really the only two proper reference broadcast spec kind of HDR monitors. There's this Canon one and Sony have their BVM 300, but they're both over 20 grand. Dolby have a range, but you can't commercially buy those. You have to have the special handshake Dolby and know this, that, and the other to do it. You know, Dolby have a new theater in London with a laser projection cinema, which is absolutely stunning. Um, and they're using that as a facility to hire out to people to come and do their cinema grades there and to do all their high-end HDR grades there. Because this is the key thing that with <coughs> HDR, going back to it coming forward, is that you know, it's where we're leapfrogging that visit to the cinema. So cinemas, yes, they can move to laser projectors and do all this stuff, but are they going to do that quickly? The cost of doing it is so expensive, and they've probably not long recently upgraded their projectors because of 3D and all this, that, and the other. There's not the revenue there to immediately do it. You know, some of the big ones, people like, you know, you kind of IMAX style, that kind of caliber, there will be some boutique cinemas, I'm sure, that will start to do this, but the mass market won't. So from a producer, point of view, unless you go to a post house that can do it, you are limited that you can't grade it properly because you don't have a proper reference monitor. Yes, you could go and buy a TV for 1,200 quid and do it on that, um, but it's big and it's not 
reference and official, but you, you could do it. Um, it's not colour accurate, it will get you in brightness yeah. levels. So for, so for the average production house that is mm. probably shooting most of its stuff on 1080p today, mm. uh, the, the use of HDR is a, is a little bit more kind of theoretical today than it is well, practical? Yes and no. Yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely the stumbling block, it's the hurdle. But in current HDR production, everything else is sorted apart from how do you grade it, how mm. do you actually look at it in your post suite. There, we are starting to see mm. things. Like, you can use one of the Atmos products, you can have one of these and grade on a little 7 inch monitor. Or you can, there are products like BenQ have got a new HDR grading monitor that's just been released, which is £700 or something like that. So, I mean, now we're talking money which you can actually put in your grading Set. suite. And I would have thought over the next year, that's where you'll start to see some of these more affordable. Yes, they're not going to be as good as that, but it's no Absolutely. different to how people for HDTV mm. now are grade, they're not grading on tens of thousands of pound monitors, they're grading on stuff that's, you know, a thousand pounds or fifteen hundred quid or Differences. something like that. So but there's a range of yeah. colouring suites. So there's the yeah. high end colouring suites who are grading your top end Netflix shows, your feature films, and yes, they're all on twenty, thirty grand mm -hmm. monitors. But there's also your average like I imagine you guys, every most nearly all of our customers, the average small um, edit suite at home, say, where you've got a couple of monitors there. At the moment, that's the, the bit. No, it, it kind of begs the question that, that as Atomos can produce a screen at seven inches that will do the job, whether it couldn't uh, produce um, uh, a reference grading monitor slightly larger at a sensible price. Certainly nothing. Atomos have ever done before. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, <laughs> so uh, you know, who knows? <laughs> but uh, but that's the thing is, you will see that there, there will be a drive to help make that more affordable because you know it's what happened. It's the only stumbling block at the moment. You've either got to pay to go to a high end post facility, or you know you accept that you're just going to do it on a smaller monitor. But you know, like the BenQ, and there are going to be other ones BenQ, that will come small out. Small HD monitors mm -hmm. have now got the, the production on dead more for on set monitoring, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. than rather than grading. I suppose you could use them as grading. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's the thing is some of these will have limitations where they're HDR capable in terms of brightness and they're able, but they don't maybe adhere to some of the conditions on how much of this color gamma yeah. you can display. Are they actually truly 10 bit or are they, you know, 6 bit or 8 bit with some trickery around it mm -hmm. and things like that? But, you know, for the purpose of mainstream production, they would certainly be good enough to get the results you kind of need. Obviously, if you're grading a feature film, you're going to have the budget to go to a post house or something. So, But that is the one thing at the moment. But you know, as we said, Atomos, that's a key reason they put the PQ and the HLG in. Obviously, hybrid log gamma is slightly different because hybrid log gamma, you can, if you can film something in hybrid log gamma, so from a camera that natively supports it, that's where that production workflow becomes easier because it doesn't matter if you're then fiddling with that on a uh, SDR. You know, monitor you can still kind of know what it's looking like correctly in SDR and then an HDR screen will just scale that appropriately but HLG in that respect is is more really for live broadcast you know if you're covering sports the football the Grand Prix or whatever that's where shooting something in HLG and just sticking it straight out to transmission you know strictly come dancing you know live TV shows and things like that that's where that will really come into its own everything else will be more of these HDR 10 or PQ Dolby Vision delivered content where it's been mastered. So actually one thing just to recap, which I didn't mention, but I should have done because it's in my notes, um, is a consideration when you're working with HDR is what you master to. So whereas traditionally you would, might have edited in a certain format uh, and then master to you know, Rec 709 or, or whatever, and with HDR there's the temptation to master to uh, HLG or Master 2 PQ1000 or Master for Dolby Vision or whatever. Um, lots of these high-end production companies are basically doing multiple grades. So you'll grade your HDR and cinema grade and you might do various different HDR grades. Don't leave your, sort, your kind of master in one of those formats. Master to something like if you shot an S-Log, master to S-Log 3 or something because that's then in its original log format. If I want to remaster that um, well, say I master it today for PQ1000, for the 1000 nit kind of limitation of most screens. But then say in two years time, there might be 3000 nit screens out that I could master that for. So then going back to that original S-Log, I can remaster that content to eke more out of that brightness 
uh, and that and that luminance detail there for that higher brightness screen. Whereas if you do a PQ1000 master now and that's your main master, you know you'll never make that. You'll never benefit from it being 3000 nit or 4000 nit or 5000 nit down the line. So that's where a hybrid log gamma is slightly different because of again it's this mastering for a format that can scale. It's down to the screen that does it, but. For post-produced content, that's where you will probably be doing a PQ master. Um, so actually keep that original log-based master because you can always then just go back to it and, and improve it. In the same way that people will be shooting 4K, delivering HD now, but they keep the 4K so they can always go back and deliver that to the client in 4K when they want it. So um, other thing just to mention around from more of a post-production point of view is that grading process. So if you talk to colorists, you get two answers. So what do you do? Like I said earlier, HDR grading is easy in a way because it's all about stylization and a few tweaks here or there. You know, you don't have to make the reason grading takes so long is you're making this compromise. You know, the stylistic side is quite straightforward. Um, so doing an HDR grade is quite quick. And because it looks so good, there's a temptation to do that first. But then as long as if you're not purely delivering it for HDR, which most content won't be, certainly for the foreseeable future, you'll need to go back and do an SDR grade. So some colorists go, oh, you do the HDR grade first, it looks amazing, and then you just work backwards and make your compromise. Problem with that is, if your client sees the HDR first, they're mm -hmm. gonna go, ah, oh, it looks amazing. And then as you go back, they're gonna start getting frustrated about the loss of quality. <clears throat> the other thing is, is from a colorist point of view, could, that could be quite frustrating as well, because you're, you've got something that looks amazing and it's difficult to kind of make those compromises backwards. So most people seem to say, do your SDR first. I kind of agree with that. You make your compromises first. Um, you've got that stylistic approach. And then the rest of the process is easy. So you've done the hard bit first, and then you just eke it out, depending on all the different HDR standards or levels that you want to master that for, and just keep unleashing more and more and more of the image until you get to the end and go, wow, that looks brilliant. No one should watch the other versions. So, But that's the thing. For end users and consumers, the, the visual difference between SDR content and HDR content is, is incredibly noticeable. And people where they're less bothered about resolution, you know, we were saying earlier, Maya the half, she, most of the time doesn't realize she's watching BBC and SD rather than HD. You know, we sit two and a half meters away from a 37 inch TV or whatever it is, you know, but actually when people like that start to see HDR content, they, don't, they might not necessarily know why the picture looks better, but if you ask them, does that picture look really good? They will go, yes. I mean, often when we do trade shows and events where you know, there's nothing advertising up saying HDR. People will just walk past that monitor when you're looking at an HDR scene that's exposed for it, and they'll just go, they'll stop, and they'll look, and they'll go, that's a really nice image. Why is that so nice? And it's only then when you explain why that they, they go, oh, that's really nice, because it looks much closer to what we see with our eye without it looking unnatural. And that's, and that's essentially it. the difference between mm -hmm. that, which is normal, and yes, you can make that look better with very clever grading and all that sort of stuff, and that which is a very simple, mm. not graded at all, but very simple lookup table in um, HDR, I mean, it looks infinitely better. Mm. Any other questions? Yep. Just a practical application. So um, I missed the first couple of minutes. So that, that Atomos is a, is a reference monitor. So it's basically a monitor and a recorder. No, so right. what Atomos do is a whole separate <laughs> section of the presentation, but I won't do that now, yeah. uh, which just gives you an overview on what they do. But fundamentally, what Atomos do is they are a recorder, a playback device, uh, a monitor, and an edit logging device. Okay. So they take the feed out of the camera, monitor that. Um, you've got the Atom HDR engine. You also have native source video monitoring. So I can view this in. Uh, HDR here, I can view it in the native source input, so the log. I can do a log to video, and again, they're all built in for all the cameras, so you can do a standard. You don't have to load in any LUTs to do that. Um, or you've got custom looks where you can then load in your own LUTs and stylize that image. Um, but then we're ultimately recording to two and a half inch media, um, so commodity HDD or SSD media. Um, and we encode in real time to Apple ProRes or Avid DNX Codex, so 10-bit 422. So again, if you've got, say, a camera with an internal bit depth or color sampling or resolution issue, so a lot of 4K cameras on the budget side, for example, are 4K, but they'll record it as 8-bit 420. The sensor is, like FS5, good example, is a 12-bit 14-stop dynamic range sensor, but 4K it records as 8-bit 420. Um, if you 
you know, come out over that on HDMI, you get 8-bit 422. But if you put the RAW upgrade on it, you then get 12-bit RAW out. So then you can come into one of our recorders and get 12-bit RAW, or you can get 10-bit 422 Pros or DNX. So you're kind of bypassing limitations within the camera. And then we give you playback and metadata tagging. Really, it's designed to be one tool that helps you expose frame uh, and focus correctly. I give you all of those tools that you'd normally get from a monitor, but then also be your recorder to give you a, you know, ProRes and DNX are mm -hmm. the standard for post-production, Final Cut and Adobe and Avid, they're built around these codecs, they want those codecs. It's a bigger file, but it's optimized, so the computer has to do less work to actually process it, so it's less CPU intensive. And ultimately, the highest quality settings, they're visually lossless. You know, all video cameras use um, compression technology that's ultimately derived from what we use for delivery, so they're all MPEG, essentially derived compression technologies, um, which are, are brilliant codecs, but they're delivery codecs. They're for taking an image, compressing it, and making it look great on face value. But in doing that, they add artifacts because it's what was around for TV, DVD, Blu-ray, streaming services, web, all that kind of stuff. So when you get into post-production and you start working with those files, you get artifacts, you get banding, you get, you know, it's like having a JPEG and a RAW. Um, but without going to raw video, ProRes and DNX are your, your best friend, essentially. Um, so, yeah, so that's basically what Atomus do. So, we're coming to the very particular with a 4K show, 50p in HDR, and we have a Sony F7 Mark I. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What's the reason to so, so Basically, do you, what frame rates do you, so it's an HD. It's a UHD. Uh, UHD. UHD. 50p, yeah. So, 50p, basically, what you would, what I would recommend you do, um, ideally, if you have the XDCA on your FS7, the, which is the extension pack, okay. uh, Atomus' product, the Shogun Inferno, mm -hmm. um, basically will then take the raw output from the FS7 via the XDCA, and you can then record that as 4K P50 or 4K P60 ProRes, mm -hmm. um, and obviously you've got all the HDR monitoring within that, so then you can expose that correctly for that. So that's perfect setup. I mean, that's the thing, is that camera then, you know, becomes immensely capable. If you yeah. don't have the XDCA, we can do everything up to 4K P30, but not 4K P50. Right, okay. Does the Mark F7 Mark II change that? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's the output, um, the SDI output is yeah. only, I mean, technically you could do it over, without the XDCA, you could do it over HDMI. Again, with the Shogun Inferno, the Shogun Inferno is the Atomos product you need, which is that one over there on that FS7. Um, which is basically doing um, uh, 4K DCI, 50 and 60p 4K. Uh, the Shogun Flame and the Ninja Flame only do 4K P30, so you can't get that 50p if you need that. And again, the reason they've probably stipulated that is because of this drive with the second phase of UHD TV, which is to push it to 4K, 50p and 60p. Like you'll notice even a lot of these new AV amplifier receivers for surround sound and doing all your home switching of channels, they're all now 5060p 4K HDMI 2.0 because they know that that drive is going to be there for people like Netflix and Amazon to deliver 4K P50 content because it will make that 4K content look as good movement-wise as 1080p 25 did. So, yeah, it just it depends on whether you want to have that preference to come out with um, HDMI or SDI. But, yeah, Shogun Inferno and then either over HDMI with the core camera or if you put the XDCA you can do it over SDI. Is there any way uh, with these machines to uh, take a snapshot of what you're getting so you can show the colorist what you're going for? Uh, well basically if the colorist is on set that's the for Rec 79 at the moment obviously you can put a LUT on it for HDR it's just doing a linearization of the log so you will see the lighting and everything as per the camera sensor in terms of the color gamut, the white balance and things like that. If from a colorist point of view, you're gonna go for something quite stylistic, so you will be changing the, the chromacity of how your colors are mapped for stylistic reasons. At the moment, there's not a capability to do that. Atomus are looking at within the Atom HDR engine to basically put that ability in there. So effectively, it's like adding a LUT in there. Um, obviously, it's not doing anything to do with the luminance, but it's doing something just to do with your color mapping. So that basically will come in time. It's not available now, but it will it's come. It's a very high-end feature. For, ex for example, on this one, this plugs into a tangent colour surface mm -hmm. so that you can be doing exactly this setup. We can have it in um, 
full screen mode, obviously, and I can have a colour touch surface down here, be grading it live and saving that grade onto a USB stick for reference. And you can basically grade on set there yeah. and send that back to the colourist. Now, of course, that's, yeah. that's high end. Yeah. So Atomus can then support um, that through doing an output. So from the camera, you go into your Atomus recording, look at what the camera is seeing. Yeah. You output that PQ or pass that through to here, and then that monitor then has the plug-in for for grading it on set and having a look at that. So high-end productions would probably do that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, lower-end productions wouldn't be able to afford to do that. Which is really why Atomus are working on this interjection of you know, chromacity changes within the Atom HDR to load in. Okay, well this is great what the camera's doing, but I want to do this to make it look like this old film stock or this, have this look to it stylistically, and then load that change in. Um, because it's... And that would be metadata? Or metadata? Yeah, it would essentially be in the same way that a lot is. I mean, the other thing that Atomus have been asked about is this kind of like magic HDR button. Um, so that, you know, here it's great that if I come into my HDR engine and I'm looking at how that looks, you know, with my dynamic range slider set where it is and obviously the right colour gamuts and things, when I go back to post and I load the footage in, you know, that's what I see. I see the original log footage, so I then have to load in settings or grade my way to the point that I was at. So what Atomus are also looking at doing is doing this kind of like export of each shot setting. So you're you know, here is your reference metadata for the dynamic range of that scene for, uh, you know, the colour gamut that was used. So again, when you go into post, a bit like Carl was just saying on here, you can save that to a USB stick and go off. You know, with here, it's saved onto the drive with your footage in the same way that our XML data for, you know, good, bad, overexposure, colour correction, bad audio kind of metadata is. You can then um, load that in. Uh, to your NLE and your DaVinci or whatever you're grading in and go here's my start this is what I was shooting on set and then at that point you can go right well I want to make these changes in terms of stylistic look so so those kind of features will come um, it's just the implementation of how they do it and how it's imported and things like that but yeah essentially it's, it's just metadata so it's kind of easy to add <coughs> Anything else? No? Okay, fine. Thank you very much, Richard.